Brandis, it's been an eventful week at City Hall and it's only Tuesday. There's the ongoing vaccine mandate battle, voting on the new budget and a new ward map proposal that increases Latino representation by two seats while reducing black majority wards by two seats as well. And here to talk about all of this are Alderwoman Silvana Tavares of the 23rd Ward, Alderman Harry Osterman of the 48th Ward, Alderman Scott Wagesback of the 32nd Ward and Alderwoman Maria Haddon of the 49th Ward. Welcome all of you back to Chicago tonight. Uh, Alderwoman Tavares, I want to start with you. You introduced this ordinance to give City Council veto power over the mayor's vaccine mandate for cops and city workers. Now you say you're, you're in favor of vaccines, so why are you opposed to the mayor's vaccine mandate action? Thank you, Paris. I, I just want to be clear that this, this ordinance that I introduced is not a buyback vaccine. This is um, an opportunity for the City Council to properly vet uh, mandate that is proposed by the mayor. And if I might start by saying the reason that I introduce it is because this city of Chicago is going through a public safety crisis and this mandate is just making it worse. The mayor's actions through this mandate is just making it worse. One of the things in this mandate is a non-disciplinary no pay status. What does that mean? If city workers don't fill that out, the portal or get vaccinated, they're fired by the end of the year. I don't want to see police or firefighters not protecting our streets and keeping us safe. That is wrong. We are already at a shortage of police officers as it is, and we're trying to recruit more. This doesn't help. So you're saying there should be no no uh, disciplinary action if police or other city workers fail to disclose their vaccine status? No, it's a personal choice. I'm vaccinated. My family and I, we got vaccinated because we chose to, not because we were forced to do so. All right, Alder, Alderman uh, Harry Osterman, is this a power you think city council should have to override uh, a, a mandate like this that the mayor puts in, in place? I think we have to come together on this issue, but I think uh, you know Mayor Lightfoot and Dr. Arwadi have helped lead our city through a pandemic. And um, I think it's critical that all public workers get vaccinated. I think they are serving uh, Chicagoans around the city of Chicago, whether it's public safety or on the back of a garbage truck. I think they should be vaccinated, but I think that um, it's critical when we come to public safety that we come together more. And I think a lot of the, the back and forth um, needs to be put to the side. We gotta come together on what's gonna make our city safe, whether it's through the vaccine or through um, reducing the violence across the city. And, and older woman had the FOP president has made a lot of comments comparing mandates to Nazi Germany. He's had to retract some of those comments, although not all of them. And he says he's going to come after uh, the seats of older people that don't vote in favor of this. Uh, do you take that uh, as a as a serious threat? I um, I'll, I'll say it's distracting from the issue. Um, I, I agree with with Alderman Osterman in that this is something we need to come together on. Uh, we have a lot of vaccines that are required for service. It's required at the federal level. It's required for the military. It's required for a lot of public service. It's required for congregate living. Um, I do understand and hear my colleague Alderman Tavares raising some of the concerns that she brings. And I think that we need to instate this and work through this in a way that brings us together that makes the best decisions for safety for our public employees and the public in general. Um, and I hope that we can bring people to the table. Um, statements like Mr. Uh, Katanzara um, has been more routinely making does not achieve that. It, it pushes us apart. And I don't think that's going to help anyone uh, solve the problem or make Chicago safer. Alderman Waggis, and if I, if I, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Alderman Tavares, yeah, go ahead. No, if I may add, you know, what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that we should come together. And I totally agree with them. We should come together. It's important for my colleagues and I to weigh in on issues like this. This is a modest proposal. And all I'm saying is that the city council should be engaged and have a say in the process when it comes to mandates. Uh, uh, for instance, we could... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because I want to get Alderman Waggis back. I'm sorry, Alderman Tavares. I, I need to get Alderman Waggis back because, you know, this uh, this ordinance did go to the Rules Committee, which is popularly known as legislative purgatory. It did not have the votes to advance. So, Alderman Waggis back, does that mean that this issue is, is kind of DOA or or might it No, uh, Paris, I think we'll be able to hear it at some point. Uh, what we've seen over the last uh, couple of years is that the Rules Committee is acting differently than it did in the past, and we are hearing a lot of these ordinances. So I'm not concerned about that. Um, I would just say the same thing as my colleagues, encourage everyone to work together, encourage every city employee to get the vaccine. 
Um, when you think about the city council making decisions, healthcare decisions for every individual, I think that's problematic. But I also think that we have to look at the liability of someone who contracts COVID and is working as a, um, a city official or a city staff or somebody, a municipal employee that's out there in, uh, interacting with people every day. And we know that we've had uh, hundreds, if not well over a thousand people contracted that are city employees. And we've got to be very careful about the liability issues there too. All right, all right. So it seems like a lot more debate to go on this, but I want to move over to the budget to Alderman Osterman. The part of this budget uh, that was added in is $660 million of new borrowing to, to spend on new initiatives. Uh, can the city afford something like that when it's already in debt up to its ears? I think that it can. I think that the budget team has put together a budget that uh, will have the ability to, to pay off that debt down the road. I think what's critical to understand is that that's bonding that's going to be used for capital projects, but specifically uh, on housing projects um, that are going to really lift up communities. I look at this budget as a historic budget that will really try to invest in communities that have not seen the investment that some neighborhoods have and really help support people that have uh, been most deeply impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, Alderwoman Haddon, uh, when the budget was first introduced, uh, progressive aldermen weren't exactly happy with uh, the amount spent on programs like mental health or housing or assistance for low-income residents, especially given the $1.9 billion in federal relief aid the city got. The mayor wanted to use more of that to pay down debt. Uh, have there been changes made that have pleased progressives now? Um, I guess I would say there have. Um, so there's been some some robust discussions uh, through our progressive caucus with other colleagues um, as well. And I believe that we've been able to look at the proposal that was given us and to expand some of the opportunities, particularly around um, mental health and health care. So it, what you're seeing uh, tomorrow that we'll vote on has some pretty historic investments in public employees for mental health service and then our Department of Public Health, which is excellent. Um, uh, Alderman Ostrin mentioned some of the bond funds, some of that's gonna be committed to helping with single room occupancy preservation. So an important issue um, all over the city. And um, a big thing here that, that we talked about when this was proposed is how are we gonna make sure that we come through on our promises with these AR, uh, ARP funds. And so the new subcommittee around transparency and accountability for these funds, I think is going to help to provide that reassurance that Chicagoans need to make sure that money is going exactly where we said it's going to. All right, Alderman Tabaris, uh, you were one of a handful of city council members that voted no on this budget in the budget committee. Um, explain your opposition. Because we need to be investing. You know, I, I heard one of my colleagues mention about investment. We're not investing enough for our small businesses. My small businesses, my businesses are struggling in my ward, not because of the lack of business, but because because but because they cannot hire people. They can't there's people, there's so many signs that I see on my corridor that they're hiring, applying now. How are we supposed to help people? How are we supposed to help our businesses? Um, with that, and I asked the mayor to remove the item, the line item of direct cash assistance. I asked her about that, and she said no, and she told me it's a giveaway. Now, what about our small businesses? We need to be helping people find Are you work. talking about direct cash assistance in the universal basic income pilot? Is that's, that what yes, that's okay. correct, the direct cash assistance. Yes, the one-year pilot program. So you're saying you would, you would rather see some of that go to small business instead of directly to... Exactly, people. and help people get back to work. Uh, small, we need to be helping our small businesses. They have been through a lot the past year and a half. And well, also and the proper... Yeah, Alder Wohnhead, uh, I'll, I'll let you jump in here. Uh, I'll, I'll just add, um, we do need to support our small businesses. And so um, in the Chicago Rescue Plan, we had proposed $80 million for small business and workforce. And what we're seeing in uh, the 2022 budget we get to vote on tomorrow is actually $87 million. Uh, investment in small business and workforce support. And that's in addition to the guaranteed income, which again is helping our working families. Um, so some of this is for people who are running small businesses, right? right. Um, who aren't making enough to make ends meet. And that cash assistance program is gonna go a long way towards a holistic approach to really helping our communities recover. So it seems like a both and approach to help for small business here and help for uh, low income individuals. Alderman Wagespeck, I'll pose the same question to you that I posed to Alderman Osterman with that 660 million in new bonding, given all the borrowing the city has incurred, especially under COVID, is this a fiscally sound budget 
uh, noting that the, the city has a lot of outstanding debt. Yeah, this is a really sound and solvent plan for uh, refinancing and for the future outlook of uh, both our debt and our pension payments. And remember, those are the two biggest drivers of uh, cost of government in Chicago and a lot of other cities. And when you look at what other cities have done compared to Chicago, we are putting that money into small businesses. We're putting the hands into people or money into the hands of people who need it. Well, then who will go to those small businesses and, and patronize them on that side of things. But um, I think the only thing you have to look to today is that, um, you know, we are, uh, we see the rating agencies saying that there's a stable outlook for Chicago across all of those agencies. And that is a big, I think, driver of a positive outlook for the city now and well into the future. And it's because we started a couple of years ago, looking at things differently, getting rid of scoop and toss, and really uh, making sound investments as uh, Alderman Haddon said with, with the funds from the ARP. All right, well, a lot to watch for tomorrow as you all and uh, the remaining 46 of your colleagues meet for the full city council meeting. And our thanks to Silvana Tavares, Harry Osterman, Scott Wagesback, and Maria Haddon.